friends, welcome to Ancient Wisdom for the 21st Century. We're glad you're here once more. Well, tonight we continue with probably the most important part of the foundations of existence. That is, creation according to the ancient wisdom. Now, this is completely different from the Big Bang, completely different from uh, biblical creation. And the, the difference is, is that it has integrity where the other two don't. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Now, you're not going to get this the first time. I know that. I know because it took me a long time to get it myself. But if you'll just go with the flow tonight and let everything enter your consciousness, you'll put it together by yourself. And uh, it'll be something you can really rely on because it tells you uh, the big questions of who am I, why am I here, where did I come from, and where am I going? So we'll be back with that in just a moment. Okay, we're back, and we will now embark on the ancient wisdom single theory of everything, a scientific account of creation which was taught to the spiritual aspirants in the ancient mystery schools. It's scientific in the truest sense because it represents the, the synthesis of science and religion and is unique in the fact that being free from religion's scientific absurdities and science's anti-religious prejudices, it has complete scientific, religious, and philosophic integrity. Everything fits together in a seamless oneness which unfolds step by step in progressive stages of creation. Today, because of the broad lack of real spiritual purpose in people's lives, the greatest human need is for factual knowledge of the foundations of existence, to know where we came from, who we are, why we are here, and where we're going. If we do not know our purpose in life, how can we act with purpose? Without such knowledge, we're left to act according to the dictates of our subconscious minds, which absorb and store the appearances of life we see going on all around us. Thus our minds cannot help but conclude that we are all born to die. This misconception colors each of our daily thoughts, giving license to our free will to act and react according to dictates of mundane material success, wealth, power, celebrity, control, and domination, or, or the lack of it. Thus, for those who care about life and what it is really for, it's important to learn how life works in order to set oneself free from this ridiculous earthly bondage. Studying the ancient wisdom's foundations of existence is the best way for anyone to find the correct answers to all those perplexing questions concerning being, which ecclesiastics cannot answer. But it's not easy. You have to work at it. Now, some metaphysical knowledge can help the learning process because it's, it's difficult to approach cold turkey but it's not impossible. In the mystery schools of old, the neophytes were in a kind of protected environment and were instructed daily in abstract theses, so everything was geared to help their comprehension of sacred spiritual principles. The students' consciousnesses were lovingly prepared to understand the nuances of existence in, in all their varied levels and everyone had time to think and meditate and absorb the vast metaphysical concepts they were exposed to. Now, unfortunately, there is precious little of the ancient luxury of exploratory thought in today's hurried world. Most people worship money and the things it can buy, 
rather than the things of the Spirit. But a place to stop and think can still be found. In fact, it has to be found if we are ever going to regain the e equilibrium of the planet, not to mention real spiritual balance in our own lives. Studying the ancient wisdom will require you to think and think hard. Paradoxes abound. But the more you study it, the more new understandings will begin to take place in your mind. But first, you'll have to get rid of old concepts which burrow deep within your own subconscious mind automatically control your thinking processes. But if you will make an effort to put aside your fear of abstract thought and just plunge into it, you'll get it. If not at the first reading, if not at the first viewing, then the next or the next. Persistence pays off. As it so happens, the first few verses of the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and so forth, is a formidable creation myth. In five short, compact verses, it manages to afford those with the ears to hear a condensed version of the entire creation process. Now the church tries to explain these passages otherwise, declaring Jesus to be the Word, that is the Logos, and his teaching the light, and the people who can't comprehend his teaching as being in spiritual darkness. Well, such a literal exposition of this scripture stretches credulity, but since St. Paul himself tells us that all biblical scripture is open to interpretation, we may find that these verses actually contain the vast processes of a holy integral concept of how the universe came to be. Thus we try to decode the principal verses of the first chapter of St. John and see if we can find the key to the creation messages which are hidden therein. Now we start off with the first line, and the first three words are, In the beginning. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, there is only infinity. Infinity is a single, uncompounded element without boundaries, thus a self-existent unity. In short, Infinity is transcendental space in its truest meaning, that which is beyond all concepts, all existence, all duality. The ancient wisdom does not consider it to be a void or nothingness, but simply an alternate existence. Since infinity is the fountain source of all manifested existence, it is, for the dearth of a better word, God. It is also referred to as the unknowable or unutterable God in many esoteric teachings because it is infinite and thus lies beyond the knowing power of our finite minds. Infinity is depicted in the ancient wisdom as a dark circle. The endlessness of the circumference is symbolic of its infiniteness and its darkness represents uncompounded, unconditioned space. Now, interestingly enough, while the major monotheistic religions have no spiritual designation in their cosmogony for infinity, and science doesn't even recognize it at all, it is an historically viable concept. We find it alive in Buddhism. Infinity there is Arai Buddhai. In Hinduism, as Parabrahm. In the Kabbalah, as Ensof. And in Theosophy, as the Absolute, or simply Absoluteness. Because infinity is eternally unchangeable, it is also known as the only absolute reality and it is this fact that makes every created thing outside of infinity perishable, and anything that is not permanent 
is concluded to be a mirage or an illusion. The second part of the first sentence is, was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is not Jesus. Paramahansa Yogananda tells us the Word is life energy or cosmic vibratory force, and the ancient wisdom agrees. This vibratory force occurs within infinity as a desire for self-expression. Where does this desire come from? Madame Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine writes, According to esoteric teaching, the real cause of that supposed desire and of all existence remains forever hidden, and its first emanations are the most complete abstract mind can conceive. So I guess we don't have to explain where that first <laughs> vibratory force comes from. However, an excellent analogy occurs when we receive thoughts in our mind which impel us to take some kind of necessary action. A thought occurs inside our consciousness as a desire for expression, to express something, and we manifest that thought, we bring it into existence when we communicate it. It is the same for the creation of the objective cosmos. Thus this vibratory wave inside infinity is the coveted first cause which sets off the creation process, just as a thought in one's mind sets one own thinking, communicating, acting sequence in motion. It is God as first cause. Now the Word is the first emanation of the unknowable God, the divine principle, and as divine spirit. Now remember John 4.24 says God is a spirit. It will subsequently permeate all visible and invisible creation. Because it is the first emanation from the Godhead, this divine force is known in ancient wisdom as the unmanifested Son of God. The divine energy it will subsequently project will also dwell in all created things and yes, even inside you as your own God within. Now the Word, because it is the most important principle in the cosmos, has come to be known by many other different designations. Primary energy, psychic energy, Agni, Om, fire, the life principle, and even the force of Star Wars. All these names are synonymous with its powerful vibration and dominating influence. But since the word is merely an allegorical term, we will refer to it now as psychic energy from now on, because it's a truer representation of its scientific application in life. It's important to reiterate here that the word is a vibratory energy, not a godlike person. Neither is it male or female or Jesus for that matter. Its major importance is that from this divine energy emanates all subsequent manifested existence. In fact, it is psychic energy which holds the cosmos and our universe and everything in it together. Thus, everything created in the cosmos will not only be a configuration of psychic energy, but connected by psychic energy to all other created things. All is one. Thus, psychic energy is at once God and Spirit in both their infinite and manifested forms. Because of the appearance of this symbol, this step of the creation process is often referred to as the open eye, signaling the awakening of cosmic activity. As a vibration, the word can also be seen as color or sound. In the ancient wisdom, the word is also considered to be the first logos, the first form, 
although unmanifested, of God. Next comes the line, and the Word was with God. Now the appearance of psychic energy, the Word, within infinity, creates a duad. Now this is hard to understand, but a duad is a pair of elements existing together in oneness as conditions of each other. Since psychic energy is a vibration, it is considered to be light energy and therefore the light of the cosmos. It is this light that produces darkness because darkness is dependent upon light for its existence. So, in this duad of light and darkness inside infinity, light is symbolic of spirit and darkness, far from being evil, symbolizes matter. They exist at this stage of creation as potential energies within infinity because they are not yet manifested. Now I know this is the big abstract, but try to understand potential as being not manifested yet still infinite. Water makes a good analogy for understanding the integration and flexibility of spirit and matter as a duad. Water is made up of two different essences, hydrogen and oxygen. Yet they remain as one element, whether invisible in a vaporous state, solid in a frozen state, or liquid in a natural state. In each of these three different states, the essences of hydrogen and oxygen still remain conditions of each other. Got it? This analogy represents the same relationship that spirit and matter have as a duad of potentials. The ancient Taoist symbol best demonstrates the relationship of these individual potentials. The white dollop represents spirit, and the dark dollop symbolizes matter. Look closely, and you will see that if the borders of both of the dollops were expanded into a circle, they would each be the exact same size as the circumference of the circle which contains them. This graphically symbolizes their unity and their oneness. The teardrop curve shape of each dollop, plus the presence of the dot of the opposite color, symbolizes their interpenetrating nature, that they are always, in any state of being or non-being, conditions of each other. This is one of those wonderful symbols that you can gaze at before meditation and sooner or later receive a complete understanding of what it means. Again, such symbols are the language par excellence of the ancient wisdom. The duad spirit matter is also symbolized in the ancient wisdom as the invisible father spirit and invisible mother matter. Thus it is this duad that is worshipped in Eastern religions as the esoteric dual origins of all existence, the ultimate father and mother of all existence. This is also considered to be the esoteric meaning behind the biblical commandment to honor thy father and mother. The duad of potentials is referred to as the second logos in the ancient wisdom, the second form of God. And because this duad is the form of God which will now give birth to the visible cosmos, it is also called God the Mother. So we have God the Father and God the Mother. We must remember, however, that even though spirit and matter are a duad, the original force of psychic energy is also present as their vehicle of containment and expression binding both together in unmanifested oneness. These are three energies. The three energies together represent the Trinity, 
Father, Mother, and Son, the three-in-one God, which is at the root of the cosmogony of many religions. Thus the word psychic energy was with God, just as it says. Although the very idea of unmanifested potentials is paradoxical to the layman and may sound as if it were made up, the Dalai Lama, no less, in his book, The Universe in a Single Atom, tells of the 4th century Buddhist cosmologist Asanga, who cited potentiality as one of the three necessary aspects of creation. His Holiness wrote, This principle refers to the fact that something cannot be produced from just anything. Thus the concept of potential energies shown here is in perfect agreement with Buddhist thought. Again, if we think of the thought-action principle at work here, we can visualize any thought as potential action. Now the next word with, the word was with God and the word was God. This phrase is as profound as it is clear. It tells us that the trinity of potential, spirit, matter, and that which is their all-embracing and binding essence, psychic energy, is God, period. Now there's no conflict here with God as infinity because the three principles still exist as potentials and are unmanifested. Think of it as an unmanifested, aggregated form of God. Thus, God is not a supreme human being, not Jesus, and definitely not some kind of personal God, but a trinity of potential creative energies which we refer to in their totality as God. This, in fact, is the esoteric meaning of the Christian trinity. As potentials, these elements are still considered to be of the transcendental realm. This conclusion, while metaphysically correct, contains one large obstacle that might make it hard to understand, and that is the word God itself. Centuries of conditioning have made us so used to picturing God as a superhuman being that it is difficult to switch to thinking of God as an infinite transcendental principle of three unmanifested aspects. Yet this is precisely what we must begin doing now if we are ever to break the chains of religion's irrational hold on our psyches. And if we just dismiss it and conclude simply, as atheists do, that there is no God, we hurl ourselves right back into the domain of irrational thought. The Dalai Lama also supports the idea of an infinite transcendental God principle. In the book I previously mentioned, the Dalai Lama writes that if the Big Bang is taken to be the absolute beginning of the universe, he says, unless one refuses to speculate beyond this cosmic explosion, then we must accept willy-nilly some kind of transcendental principle as the cause of the universe. He says, this may not be the same God that the theists postulate, Nonetheless, in its primary role as the creator of the universe, this transcendental principle will be a kind of Godhead. So we see now, the psychic energy, the word, spirit, and matter is God, an infinite, abstract, transcendental, three-in-one, divine principle. Now the next line in St. John says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now this is why the church tells us that God made everything. The him in the above verse is psychic energy, not a personal God, supreme being, 
or even Jesus. Psychic energy is the life force of the manifested cosmos, the primary mover and shaker of all that will be created. It will be the eternal motion of psychic energy in action that will fuel the constant churning and ebb and flow of spirit and matter in objective space and time. It is psychic energy that will create all forms within the cosmos. It is psychic energy that will set the cosmos in motion, and it is the motion of psychic energy that will keep it operating on all levels of existence. Now, the Bible also supports this concept of a unified cosmos. You see, there is a remarkable passage. It's in Luke 13, 20 and 21, in which Jesus is asked by his disciples to explain the kingdom of God, that is, the fundamental nature of the universe. In this passage, Jesus states, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like a leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now, ask some minister or rabbi to figure that one out, okay? But here we go. The three measures of flour is symbolic of the three major divisions of the cosmos. The infinite realm, the transcendental realm, that's one. Two, the invisible but active spiritual planes. And three, the visible objective plane of existence. The leaven that is hidden in these three levels is psychic energy. Till it was all leaven means that psychic energy will penetrate and permeate all three levels of the universe, that's the three measures in Jesus' story. Thus all things in existence will be modes or effects of psychic energy, uniting them in oneness, or as Jesus said, till it was all leavened. Well, that's about all the time I have now, so I'll see you next week. I'm Bert Wilson. This is Ancient Wisdom for the 21st Century.